then I go to storage with the okay. So I guess I'll, I'll talk about the Watchman device a little bit, and uh, mainly because it's been approved uh, by CMS for reimbursement last week. And uh, this is, as you know, this is CPRS. Um, I don't know if you can read it. Can you read that? Yeah. Okay. Seventy-year-old male, no history of atrial fibrillation, congestive heart failure, no record, uh, preserved LA function. We then some outside facility uh, with what appears to have been COPD exacerbation as well as atrial fibrillation. And it went anticoagulation, and in this context, then developed uh, a GI hammer requiring uh, 60 units of blood, uh, PRVCs, uh, some SFT. EGD demonstrated two large gastric ulcers uh, that were embolized, uh, but then you rebled, which required repeat embolization. And the EGD was then repeated in 2015, uh, but the records were not available at the time that we did this consultation. He returns now for establishment of routine cardiac care and reports that he felt well. Um, he has baseline NYJ class 2 exertional dyspnea, but otherwise is, is fairly content. And so at this point in time, the question is, um, you know, what, what do you do with this gentleman? He's got atrial fibrillation, the peptic ulcer, these are just described, CHF. He also has uh, diabetes and hypertension, all of which, as you know, are CAT uh, risk scores. And given his age of 65, I believe, or 66, uh, his CAD fast score would be 4, right? And so his annual stroke risk would be approximately 4%. And then the question becomes, uh, what should you do? And uh, one could accept the stroke risk, uh, not anticoagulate, uh, confirm bleeding, um, arguing that um, the bleeding risk is high despite him having been treated for the ulcer. You could also say that the bleeding stroke is treated, uh, let's restart anticoagulation of warfarin. Uh, or they start anticoagulation of NOAC, that's another uh, choice. Or you tell the patient, uh, which is the easier way, if, if it's late in the afternoon, you don't have anything to do with it, you can just say you have a yearly stroke of 4%. Uh, generally, anticoagulation would be recommended, but uh, gastroenterology will have to decide whether it's safe to, to anticoagulate. So that would be the easiest answer, because at the end of the day, you got that off the plate, and then somebody else could make the decision, uh, that's probably the thing I would say the most. But the thing that comes back to you then is, is that answer. Uh, the DI person will see that <laughs> you know, your bleeding is more than 4 percent annually, uh, we'll leave it up to you uh, and your primary care physician and cardiologist, cardiologist to decide whether or not to anticoagulate. That's the problem that will come back uh, most of the time. That's never happened to you before, right? Huh? And that clinical scenario has never happened to you before? <laughs> oh, I'm just coming back like that? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Not exactly, but that's similar. I mean, you know the game, right? Mm. So this is, uh, you know, another option, obviously, uh, LA occlusion. Uh, we could bury our head in the sand, um, and this would be kind of nice to do because I hate new devices. Then you have to learn something new with all this stuff. You have to go through training and all that stuff. So you could just ignore it, and that was possible until recently. Uh, of course, um, as you might remember, last year in uh, March, that was the first um, news uh, from the FDA that approved the um, uh, Watchman for use for LAA closure. Uh, of course, it hadn't been used much in, in recent years because it wasn't reimbursed at that time. And then this just came out uh, last week sometime um, as the CMS statement that uh, they're now willing to reimburse use the Watchman for uh, LAA closure. So let's see, let's look at some of the things uh, that might be of interest. Um, I think the first thing you have to um, ask yourself, is there a role for LA occlusion in atrial fibrillation? And in order to determine that, you have to ask yourself the question, does atrial fibrillation cause stroke? And um, that question is difficult, uh, and I don't think that we know the answer to it, because in order to really know for sure, you'd have to randomize somebody to atrial fibrillation and then another person to a status rhythm, and then wait and see who develops a stroke, uh, and then you could maybe determine whether atrial fibrillation itself causes stroke. Um, so the question is difficult to answer, but a more easy um, question to answer is, is atrial fibrillation associated with an increased stroke risk? Which is not a little different from what I was talking earlier. If you want to be sure, you have to randomize some of the atrial fibrillation and science with them. We can't do that, obviously. But if you want to see if atrial fibrillation is associated with an increased stroke risk, you could find that out with a retrospective study. And the second question is, is there an increased stroke risk in atrial fibrillation <coughs> as a result of LAA thrombi? Because that's important for us if we consider LA exposure. So let's look at the first question. And the best data, the long-term data that will uh, attempt to answer that question 
is the Birmingham study, which um, included 5,000 healthy individuals that were enrolled since 1948. They were followed by annually, and cardiovascular events were reported. Uh, and this shows the event rate on the left-hand side. This is per 1,000 patients, so not per 100, per 1,000 patients uh, over two years duration. These are the risk factors for stroke, and we're just going to focus on atrial fibrillation. And you'll see that in, in red, the patients with sinus rhythm, so no atrial fibrillation, had a very low two-year stroke rate. So only about, I think it was about eight or so per 1,000 patients, very low stroke rate. But the one on the right, the blue one, uh, is those patients with fibrillation. And their two-year stroke risk uh, was about uh, 45, 43 uh, per 1,000 patients. So it's pretty high, and it's certainly a lot higher than if you didn't have atrial fibrillation. Um, well, this could just be a reflection of the patient's ages and comorbidities, not necessarily the atrial fibrillation. Uh, and so people, of course, corrected uh, for other potential risk factors and adjusted um, the calculations. And um, if you even adjust for hypertension, CHF, um, uh, sorry, hypertension, heart, um, uh, coronary disease, and CHF, then despite different age categories, you'll see that the relative risk is still uh, significantly higher with those uh, with atrial fibrillation. Um, so I think we, one could comfortably say that atrial fibrillation is not only associated with increased uh, stroke risk, but there's also an independent risk factor. And the next question is, uh, is there a relationship um, between thrombi in the left atrial appendage? Um, and is that the source of the stroke? And there's uh, two data sets. One is anatomical and physiological plausibility data. And that's very limited. And then there's echocardiography and pathological mm -hmm. specimen data. Now, I don't know if you did see this case report. Anybody have seen this slide? Because these are slides that are, that are probably in, I don't know, 50 talks a year somewhere. because. This is the one case report. Uh, this is um, Ezekiel who uh, does all the uh, NOAC trials and PARC, and he had looked at uh, a TEV, and during the TEV that performed, as you can see, that little clot embolized and <laughs> caused uh, a stroke uh, as they were performing the TEV. So I think it's pretty clear just by that one case report that LA is almost pink off stroke. So I think that's there's plausibility data for that. And um, of course, most know that. The strokes from atrial fibrillation are typically uh, bigger strokes. They typically embolize the MCA and cause larger strokes than most strokes with, say, a broad uh, disease and, and elsewhere. So not only does um, LA thrombus cause strokes, it can also cause large strokes with, with disability. And you can see here, this is um, the survival curve after a stroke with patients who didn't have atrial fibrillation versus those who had atrial fibrillation. And uh, not only is, is the stroke magnitude bigger, but the survival is poorer in those who have atrial fibrillation than stroke. And the recurrence rate is also higher in those who have atrial fibrillation than those who have stroke. These are the uh, anatomical and echo uh, data. Um, have you seen that one before? This is, again, this is the, the one publication <coughs> upon everything is based that we believe that the thrombus is in the left atrial appendage. It's the only one publication, Blackshear and Odell. That's going to be the one that's always quoted where, where people say 90% are in the left atrial band of the trauma. And what they did is they looked at TEE and um, pathological data and in about 1,300 patients. In 200 of those, um, when they saw thrombus, it was in left atrial appendage. And in the remainder uh, of those with thrombus, it was in the LA cavity. So 200 out of the 220 with thrombus were in the left atrial appendage. And that's where the 90% of thrombi uh, occur in the left atrial appendage statement comes from. Um, what is the stroke without anticoagulation? Uh, I mean, it's all seen the chat fast system. You can go through the various risk factors and determine that. Um, and then, uh, what is the stroke with anticoagulation? And um, based on all the landmark trials, uh, spina, FAS, uh, CAFA, and so forth, uh, if you lump the data together, there's uh, about 60% reduction of stroke with, with anticoagulation, and there's also uh, about the same amount of reduction in mortality. Um, how about bleeding risk? Um, there's a meta-analysis looking at all the same trials that I just uh, showed you previously. The annual bleeding risk ballpark for all comers is about 2%, uh, and there's about a 50% uh, mortality um, with uh, major bleeding. Uh, and of course, that was significantly higher than the control group without anticoagulation. Um, how about intracranial hemorrhage? What's, what's the uh, yearly risk of intracranial hemorrhage in patients with anticoagulation? Oh, yearly. 
So when, when you talk to somebody uh, who's we're seeing new and you want to start an asset valuation, uh, what what do you quote them for? Uh, to work? Yeah, it's about 25 percent, so point point four six, point three something. With with sorry, um, this this is the risk intercurrent risk with work time, right? So point five, point three. If you um, if you compare it to the risk without work time, uh, the risk is about a third of that, so it's about point one. Uh, it's 0.2 percent, so people can have intercurrent hemorrhage even without asset valuation, right? It's going to be 0.1, percent per year. So you can triple that if you uh, have somebody on asset valuation. It's about 0.5 percent. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, uh, only about 50 percent of INR levels are in the therapeutic range. Uh, most people have seen that uh, in daily practice. Although in the trials, if you look at the larger trials um, that were done recently with NOACs. Typically, the INR uh, is in the therapeutic range about 60-65% of the time, but sometimes higher depending on the trial. And then, of course, we know that a too high INR is associated with bleeding uh, risk, including the same hemorrhage, which we just talked about, and too low INR uh, is associated with, with stroke risk. And this shows it nicely here. That's also sort of a landmark paper from Heidegger, which shows that in yellow, this is the ischemic stroke rate. If you go below 2, you have almost have an exponential increase in stroke. Ischemic stroke, if you go above three, you almost have a, not exponential, but a pretty uh, dramatic increase in intracranial bleeding. Um, so it's a ther narrow therapeutic window. And there's another problem, which is that uh, most of the risk factors for stroke are also the same risk factors that will cause bleeding. And so if you look at the uh, has blood score and the cat blood score, hypertension overlaps, um, age overlaps, uh, prior stroke overlaps, uh, renal failure, which is not part of that's that score, but also a risk factor for, for stroke that overlaps with the bleeding as well. So it's not uncommon to see people at stroke risk uh, at the same time at risk of bleeding. This is not surprising that then only 50 to 70 percent of all patients with atrial fibrillation at risk of stroke are actually treated with oral anticoagulants. Uh, there's another landmark paper that shows that. These are different age categories, and you can see that only about 30 percent of people who are eligible for work are actually treated. Uh, so what do we do again, back to this initial uh, case example, uh, accept the stroke risk, you know, an anticoagulate, bleeding shortly treated, so we start anticoagulation, start uh, uh, anticoagulation with NOAC, or refer or consider the patient for atrial hemorrhage approach. Um, let me just look at NOAC, and um, this is a meta-analysis that was um, published last year, or maybe the year before, actually. Of all the um, landmark trials rely on the Aristotle, and this shows stroke or systemic embolism. And as you can see, um, overall the stroke and poor systemic embolism risk was lower uh, in those three with no act compared to work. Uh, and then this shows other endpoints with no act versus work. Uh, and you can see that the all cause mortality actually was, was lower in this meta analysis. Of course, if you look at the trials in isolation only, there's really only one trial that shows a lower mortality, which is this one. Here's all with the fixed band and that's the mortality reduction. How about the one that shows a uh, reduction in ischemic stroke? Ischemic stroke or all cause stroke, you know, larger dose of certificate trial, like 150 grams of each Not 110, but 150 grams in real life. Um, so, but anyways, if you lump it together, um, you'll, you'll see an all cause mortality reduction. And uh, you can see a very strong trend towards ischemic stroke risk reduction versus warfarin. And of course, a very important uh, reduction in hemorrhagic stroke um, with no acts versus uh, warfarin. You do see, and you can see that on the, on the bottom of the screen, um, you see I have a trait. Oh, wow. What was that? Yeah, you like that? <laughs> that yeah, that's pretty cool. So the ischemic, I mean, the uh, GI hemorrhage rate um, is, in fact, higher um, with the no acts compared to warfarin. Uh, what, what is the one uh, NOAC that has uh, also lower bleeding risk? Well, that, that could be. I'm not familiar yet with the bleeding in the doctor, to be honest with you. Yeah. So, fixed amount of mortality reduction, uh, bleeding lower, lower is statistically significant, but numerically and by absolute values, we'll see that in a moment. It's not that much lower. Um, so, that would be something to. Uh, and so uh, let's look at no active major bleeding. These are the, the three uh, bigger trials. Uh, Adoptiban 
I don't know if it's available yet, but I'm not too familiar with that yet. So I'll just go to the three figure trials. This was um, rocket the app, and you can see uh, in yellow the bleeding the uh, bleeding risk with uh, with roxaban, in red with warfarin. This was not significant, so there's no significant difference in bleeding there. Rely again, no significant <coughs> difference in bleeding, all around three to four percent annually. And this was Aristotle with Apixaban, where there was um, uh, a significant reduction in bleeding with Apixaban. But if you look at it in absolute terms, maybe a third uh, reduction in the risk. And remember, for most of those patients, um, uh, they were excluded in the trial if they had any obvious contraindications to anticoagulation. So they were probably at fairly low risk for bleeding to start with. So no, uh, don't eliminate the risk of major hemorrhage um, enough to make you feel comfortable um, using them in patients with high bleeding risk. Like in this patient, I don't know if I would feel good about using a NOAC. Uh, I mean, if I'm worried about bleeding, um, with the data that we just saw, is it going to be less likely with a NOAC, other than maybe a Pixaban, to cause less bleeding? Uh, it could with a Pixaban, but even then, it's, it's like a percent after reduction. It's still pretty high. I'm not sure I would feel that comfortable. Um, so uh, this again uh, shows what I mentioned earlier, that the GI hemorrhage rate, in fact, uh, if you lump them all together, the GI hemorrhage rate is higher. Than the so I think alternatives would be nice. Uh, what's this one here? Plato device. Plato device? OK. So that's, that was the first. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I worked on that. Oh, that's right. I have. Like I have. Like I have. First, first of cooler. Um, implanted in uh, well, 2002. Well, check out the last year. 2002? Yep. Mm -hmm. I thought you meant like where we put it. Oh, oh, uh, yeah. oh okay. Where, check out the last year. Where do you put it? In the appendix? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I know. Check out the last year. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so this was the first first recruiter, which was good, actually. It, it worked really well. Um, but for financial reasons, the company yeah, at some point in time. There was one in the pandemic where it was a new operator who didn't have appropriate sizing and positioning and you know release her and there was an immobilization and, but it was deemed to be operator uh issue and, 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 you know, and so that was really so many adverse events that we had mm, yeah we never show up the big one but in the end right i mean it worked well there's i'll show you a second but the, the data was was pretty good and uh, there was 100 and something patient trial that was published like 2005 or something that vicinity where the occlusion rate was good uh, the overall complication rate was pretty low um, and you know they always would compare their stroke rate to uh, a historical control matched by you know uh, by the chat score and, and they showed a reduction. But again, this is with respect to that. This is a, this is a Watson device. Um, what's this one here? Same dude. What's it called? The ATP, the cardiac plug, anti the cardiac plug. And um, this is the old one. Uh, and uh, this is the newer one, and you can see that they actually changed something on the um, on the on the actual plug. There's a disc in the plug. Uh, the plug uh, is a little bit uh, longer. Uh, there are a few more fixation bars, and the ratio of the disc to the plug is, is a bit bigger, so you have more overhang, which um, <coughs> is advantageous because um, if you have an anatomy where um, you're worried about full coverage. Uh, um, you're worried about, uh, say, if you have a very elliptical appendage ostium um, and you implant a, a round watchman, you might have residual leak. Um, if you have something extending beyond the orifice, like with the um, ATP, then if there's a potential for less, for less leak. Uh, and if there are other reasons to use it, but um, that's, those are the uh, other devices, uh, maybe the second frequent in, in the world with the ATP. Uh, that's Valerius. What's that one? Uh, that's a quicker device, and it's approved uh, in Europe, so it has to be one. There's one other device that didn't include with the life, life tech, which is also approved. What's that called? Like, what's that one? That's what's Quigert. Quigert. Um, and so there you have the advantage that um, after implantation, so here would be, here'd be the appendage, uh, here's, the, here's the atrium. You can actually inject through the sheath into the tool, the appendage, uh, and see how it, I didn't even touch it. <laughs> oh, good, good. Um, so anyways, uh, the principle is uh, straightforward. This is just uh, to show the uh, the steps for implantation. This is a transeptal puncture, 
that this is the anatomy with uh, in blue is the aorta in the middle, um, and then you can see the uh, the fossa, um, the, the back wall of the, of the right atrium, uh, and then the superior portion is the SVC and the roof of the atria. Um, superior anterior is the aorta, uh, and then um, inferior anterior is the, the plecus is the annulus and the uh, coronary sinus there, and then inferior is the intermetria. Some people used to keep pigtail um, for puncturing when it was done without a PE to guide yourself where, where the aorta might be, which is one of the structures that you don't want to uh, puncture inadvertently. Um, and there, there are many different systems for puncture. There's the traditional system. Um, this is um, the uh, FL1 sheath uh, and the BRT needle. So the needle you can see there. Uh, and what it has is uh, it's got the sharp tip, of course, and then at the uh, proximal edge, uh, there's a metal arrow which, because the BRT uh, needle is bent, it'll kind of keep track to where your needle is pointing. Uh, so um, if the arrow is pointing to, say, 5 o'clock, uh, that's where your needle will be pointing um, uh, visually. Um, and then there's a valve uh, that you can use to attach to a um, pressure gauge. And there's a dilator, and there's the uh, seat. Uh, first, you assemble the, the needle in the dilator, flush that, assemble it, and then you can put the BRT needle into the dilator. And you want to, uh, at first, when you advance it or when you put it up in the uh, SVC, you want to uh, keep the needle away from the tip of the dilator until you're uh, ready to puncture. So you want to keep about two finger breaths between the arrow of the um, needle and, and the dilator hub. Um, yeah, well, okay, so. Uh, at the VA, we use the Bayless system a lot. Um, who was there today? Um, uh, uh, we use the Bayless system for data puncture. Um, but um, I think in most other institutions in the world uh, that are more experienced, um, they would probably use the BRT and the uh, SL1C um, for puncture. Um, the advantage of the Bayless, I'll get to that in a moment, is that you need to exert less tension or pressure on the intracheal septum than. Um, that helps if you have a very mobile septum, for instance, uh, that might be helpful. Um, the basic technique is you put a um, J wire into the superior cava, then you follow that with the um, dilator and the sheath, and then you take the wire out. You advance either a BRT needle or a Bayless RF catheter uh, and make sure it doesn't protrude the tip uh, of the dilator and, and the um, sheath. And then uh, typically you want to turn it. Uh, this is again the, the arrow and, uh, and the two finger breaths um, until you're ready to puncture. You want to turn uh, the arrow to about five o'clock, which puts you into a slightly posterior position for puncturing. And as you do that, you then pull back the whole system together. And there's a double hump. Once the first hump is from the SVC into the left atrium, and then uh, the second hump is typically into the fossa out there. And you can inject some dye if you want um, to. Um, in the uh, fossa, uh, and then you can look under the fluoroscopy, which should look like this when ready to um, uh, puncture the system. Uh, this is the REO. Do you use uh, pigtail in the RA? Uh, no, no. I, I think now it, it, <coughs> you can you can see it so well with PE that it would be too much of a hassle and risk to put in the pigtail because it, it's so hard, I think, to puncture any structure nowadays with PE guidance that. I don't think you would need it. If you did it only on fluoroscopy, I think that might be helpful. I've never done that, but I could imagine it being helpful. And and that just shows the um, I hope that's what you're Yeah, yeah. You know what I did though is I, I took the I'll try that. Try the old corn. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um so this just shows the, the process. You have that the two finger breaths, now you're ready to puncture, you, you push that needle in, and then uh, so it shows the same thing over and over again, push the needle in. 
and then uh, as the next step, once you once you're butted against the septum, you have if, if you have connected, you have a dampening pressure, which you can see here. And then as you cross, you should see less atrial pressure. Um, that's just you know, these punctor and less atrial pressure. Um, you could go through a PFO, um, and I think it's not unreasonable. Um, I think it's uh, once you've done a few of them, going through a PFO is, is reasonable. Um, but the alignment, and I'll, I'll slide more on the alignment of the teeth is typically not not very good uh, for LA code purposes. I think most of the time, posterior um, and inferior positioning would, would be more favorable. Um, and, and this tried to show it uh, a little bit. Uh, here's, here's the sheath. You have a double curve sheath, which I'll show in a moment. Um, so this would be a, a superior puncture where you kind of abutting the roof a little bit, whereas inferior puncturing where you are more aligned most of the time. Um, and then uh, this shows how you want to be inferior a little bit uh, on the bike cable view. Um, Though if it doesn't play, it shows you something with codex. Uh, and so I don't know why that would be. Um, it's not the most important of of uh, slides, I suppose. But um, what it's trying to show is the tenting. See the tenting in, at the interatrial septum. Um, Here's the tenting there, and there's the abutting um, uh, transeptal tissue. And uh, it's probably didn't play that. And here's the tenting. And this shows a, a hypermobile septum. See this is the septum going all the way like this. So you're not even across here. And you see how close you get to the opposite wall of the left atrium. Um, that's an example where I think um, the uh, beta system is very helpful because you don't need to push as much uh, in order to cross the septum. So now here you're across. And I was hoping that it's playing. Um, this again shows the, the more posterior location versus anterior. This is anterior here. So you're hugging the aorta a little bit, which um, uh, causes malalignment of the sheath, frequently with the appendix, whereas if you're posterior, you're, you have a better, more favorable alignment with the uh, left atrial appendix. And uh, hopefully, now, you know, this is really strange because these are all the same videos. Um, and the first one. Oh, let's go to your yeah. flash drive. Oh, yeah, I'm going to flash drive. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, Well, get the idea. Sorry, <laughs> yeah, it plays. I mean, everything played. Like, no, yeah, like, you know, multiple times. Um, uh, the more interesting stuff comes in the moment. Also. So, and this is actually uh, what plays. Uh, this is shows you the fossa here. <clears throat> this one here is it would be an anterior puncture, right? Anterior superior would be a posterior inferior. And I just want to show um, where the aorta is. Second valve, superior and superior like cava, fossa. And um, this is the, the uh, anterior superior puncture, inferior posterior puncture. Uh, and okay. Uh, I want to show the alignment in the cadaver, um, which is much better if you puncture inferior posterior in most of them. Problems, uh, as you saw earlier, there's a possibility of a hypermobile septum, and, uh, which can then cause you to sort of dump into the opposite uh, atrial wall. Uh, or you can have a very um, rigid septum after EC procedures. Uh, this earlier one showed you that hypermobile septum. This doesn't play, but you, can, you get the idea here. And uh, so mm, there's 
is also, as I mentioned earlier, the beta system, which is a radio frequency um, scatter. The tip of that is not sharp, but there's a radio frequency transducer that will heat the uh, tip. And this still goes through the same dilator and sheet that I mentioned earlier, and that, that's that actual catheter, the beta catheter. It emits uh, radio frequency, and by that it heats up the septum and, um, and facilitates puncture. You can set it at, say, you know, a two seconds, 10 watts, or 100 degrees, that can give you the right response. Oh, that's that's fine. Yeah. That's interesting because the same same video <coughs> this way with him. So that's that um, at, at the time of puncture. This is not beta, this is a you know DRK needle that, that was across earlier. Now you can push the dilator uh, and the, the sheet into the left atrium. Dilator and sheet. And then uh, you should administer heparin, typically about ten thousand units. Uh, and then what you would do is put a uh, extra stiff AMPAS wire in the um, left upper pulmonary vein. Uh, and then you're ready to put the uh, um, delivery uh, sheet uh, in system. So the watchman is double curved sheet. Uh, I hope this plays. Yeah. You see this uh, curves in, in two different directions. So there's a double curve this way, but there's also a sideway curve. Uh, you can see that. So there's two, two types of curves. Uh, there's also a, a single curve sheet, but I don't see it used much. Um, and this would then be the pigtail. Now you've, you've advanced the delivery system. You can see that by the markers there, over the extra stiff ampas into the left atrium. And then you take that ampas wire out and you put the uh, pigtail catheter in the left atrium and then position that left atrial appendix. The reason you have different markers on the system is because uh, you have different sizes of, of washroom devices and the smallest size, the um, um, that portion, so here's, here's the washroom like this. It's the uh, uh, distal portion that faces the atrium uh, would be right at that marker here. The next higher size would be in between the markers. So it helps your position. So if you want to, say, use the smallest size, you would want to position it, the sheet such that the, the first marker aligns with your ostium, your landing point. Whereas if you want to put a bigger size um, washroom in, then you would want to have this marker here aligned with the uh, ostium and with the landing point. So this, this guides you in, in position. Um, this just shows the, um, the catheter and then ramping the sheet over the pigtail catheter and see can you see as atraumatic as possible. And this is the actual delivery catheter. So the delivery catheter, which has the watchman in it, goes into the delivery sheet. The delivery sheet is the one with those three markers. And the delivery catheter goes with the watchman inside into the delivery, delivery sheet. And um, then you have to interlock the delivery catheter and the delivery sheet. And the reason you do that is because the watchman is attached to a cable. And eventually, you'll hold the cable in place where you want it to unfold. And then you want to be able to take both the delivery sheet and catheter back as a unit. And so you need to interconnect the delivery sheet and the catheter. It can, there's kind of a locking mechanism that you can use uh, in the uh, And so here is the advancement of the delivery catheter and the sheet. And then it locks right there. And then you're ready for deployment. And you just have to hold on to the delivery cable and pull back the delivery sheet in its place. As that's done, I don't know how well it comes up on the screen, but you can see it unfold right there. It's subtle, but it, it, you can see it better if you look at it in, in real. Yeah. And then uh, once it's deployed, you can, for releasing it, you can inject contrast to the sheet. And uh, you, you think there's something wrong with it? Uh, So there's still contrast going in the appendix, right? Yeah. Is that to be expected? Or? Yeah, so the the covering, remember that membrane on the Watchman? It's a, it's a membrane that is porous uh, when you put it in, so it's, it's not going to seal anymore. You, you will have contrast going through the membrane. Yeah. And only when it endothelializes, uh, that, that's when you end up getting a good seal. So that's, this is perfectly normal. You will have contrast.
discuss going into the appendix uh, on a routine basis uh, because the membrane does not heal at this point. What is the evidence? So you saw the Plato device earlier. Um, this was the uh, um, first in man. Uh, uh, first in man. Uh, Plato paper um, that was published in, in 2002. And all, all these patients, just remember, and this is kind of interesting, in the beginning, uh, there was no anticoagulation after implantation. So the Plato was implanted. Uh, and, and this was not followed by anticoagulation. This was strictly in patients who were considered to be absolute no candidates for anticoagulation. So the only therapy at the time was aspirin uh, or either cyclopidine or, or clopidogrel. And so um, and that's just something to, to keep in mind uh, for management uh, when, when you face what to do after a long term application. Um, and then, then came, then came the uh, publication in 2005, which was uh, a little bit over 100 patients, uh, 108 patients that I went played with device implantation. Again, all of them had contraindications to warfarin. And this is a, then a comparison of event rates um, in those with a played device versus uh, those who didn't have a device closure. And um, then um, they uh, you know, matched these by, by CAS score. And, uh, this is just on the right hand side of the historical, historical chat <coughs> match control group. So, this is not a randomized trial, right? This is just comparing their implant with any historical control with matched chat score. Right? So, not randomized, just uh, I guess what do you call it, retrospective uh, and, and their stroke rate was with the player device lower than that to be expected in a historical uh, chat, chat match, uh, match group. Um, so then that paved the way for other devices, and just as the Watchman came out, in fact, there were people using um, just regular amplant occluders uh, to do the appendage, which worked okay. Remember, they didn't have any, any fixation parts, so embolization uh, was more of a problem, and so this didn't, never really went further, but they did use um, regular amplant uh, devices to close the appendage in the beginning. Uh, but then the uh, Watchman device uh, was released, and uh, this is, a, of course, the Madmark trial to check, yeah. Two to one randomization, LA closure versus amplifier using Wolfram. Um, and just to recapitulate the study design, uh, which is important, so what, what you're going to do when you have a patient who is closed. Um, in Protect AF, patients at baseline had to be on aspirin for a few days. And then after the procedure, they were uh, kept on uh, aspirin, 81 milligrams, um, and were put on heparin uh, as soon as uh, palpably safe after the procedure until with warfarin, the INR was therapeutic. And uh, after that, uh, at about 45 days, about a month, a PD was done. There was no thrombus, no residual leak. Uh, then um, at that point in time, the regimen was changed from warfarin uh, to aspirin 325 in clopidogrel 75 uh, until six months time, at which time the TE was repeated and there was no thrombus, no no larger residual leak. Uh, aspirin alone was, was used after that. And the control group obviously was more from the INRs. Uh, the INRs were therapeutic in, uh, in a good range uh, of patients, six to, uh, in a good range of time. And um, it was, as you might remember, non inferiority uh, trial design. Uh, uh, you know, I, I'm glad you guys understand what non inferior trial design means because I don't really, I don't really understand it. I just know what what the kids would say, but <laughs> you guys don't understand it. I think it's just great, you know. But it was non inferior design, um, and it was a primary efficacy endpoint and a safety endpoint. And uh, the primary efficacy endpoint was in combination of scope, uh, cardiovascular death, and systemic embolism, and the safety endpoint were uh, pericardial fusion, major bleeding, intervention. There were seven out of seven patient enrolled, uh, 244 controlled, 453 in the Watson group. And, and this shows the, the first publication results. Remember, there's a newer uh, Protect AS publication that came out in uh, 2014, I believe. Uh, five year data. Um, this is the first initial publication. And um, as you can see, uh, in terms of efficacy endpoint, it was non inferior to Washington to uh, anticoagulation. 
was non inferior uh, in terms of all stroke, uh, and it was non inferior in terms of all cause mortality. Uh, and obviously, as you can imagine, um, the safety endpoints uh, were, ha were worse with the uh, implementation um, because you have the upfront procedural risk, um, and about 4% had uh, pericardial effusion, of which about a third had to be drained surgically. Uh, and two thirds were drained percutaneously. Uh, I, I want to stress that this looks um, <coughs> this looks concerning and, and worrisome, and, and I, I think still it is somewhat worrisome. Um, but to be fair, none of these patients up to this date have had a permanent um, complication from these events, with the exception of, of one patient who had a, a large stroke. Uh, the other strokes that occurred, um, there were five strokes in total, uh, were relatively minor strokes, but in terms of the pericardial fusion, requiring surgery, major bleeding, etc., there were no permanent sequels. Uh, but anyways, those were concerning enough um, for the FDA not, not to approve it uh, at the time. Uh, this stands then in, this, in proportion to uh, the control group, and there, of course, um, over time, they didn't have the upfront procedure, but over time, their, their bleeding risk uh, goes up. And, uh, and you know, it's not just going to stop here, it's going to continue uh, in a steady um, progression, probably, because they are going to be on warfarin uh, for long term. Whereas those patients will be off warfarin, so their, their bleeding risk is probably not going to change too much. Um, So that, uh, those data were good. <coughs> and there was also a camera which is not very good. Maybe some water, of course. I think it's probably just not much water. Oh, they both are. Oh, you can take your. Again, about uh, 500 patients that were followed in the registry. And what they really want to look into mainly is uh, safety rate or safety event rates um, with the registry, comparing new and old uh, operators and um, looking at the impact of operator experience and experience with the device in terms of safety endpoints. Um, and you can see here that this is uh, this curve shows the protected uh, safety endpoints. So in the beginning, you had a relatively high event rate, and then uh, this is this is early early part of protected So the first half of protected app, fairly high uh, procedural event rate, and then the latter half of protected app, the event rate actually um, decreased significantly, uh, which comes along with not just operator experience but also just experience with the device. Um, and then this, this shows the uh, CAP data where the event rate was even lower than the, in the latter half of the like, yeah. So either experience with the device or experience with the operators um, decreased the event rate. Um, these are the uh, event rates numerically. You can see um, uh, in protected like, yeah, there was a 1% stroke rate, uh, five patients had a stroke, and uh, there were zero strokes in, um, in the CAP uh, registry. Part of the stroke risk, people say, I'm not sure that I'm 100% I'm convinced, but um, there was a problem with de airing the system uh, in the beginning. And um, the thought process is that some of the strokes were related to um, incomplete de airing of the system. Um, with that knowledge, uh, it's possible that people uh, recognize that and that the stroke risk was probably lower because of that, because better de airing. And then the pericardial effusion rate is. Has been lower in the uh, in the cap registry and in the like, yeah, so it's roughly five percent, four point percent, and um, that still, you know, the cap data w was good, but it still didn't uh, reach the uh, FDA approval. And what they then suggested is they wanted another trial um, that was designed uh, more or less identical to uh, protect the to confirm that the safety data is uh, adequate and to reassess the efficacy. And that was the prevailing uh, trial. Again, the design was nearly identical to uh, the FDA, a two to one organization. Uh, 
they had two uh, effic efficacy endpoints. One was a composite of stroke, systemic embolism, CV or unexplained death. The other one was a major ischemic efficacy, which was really ischemic stroke or systemic embolism, excluding the uh, perioperative risk or, or complication. Then there was a safety endpoint, uh, uh, all-cause death, ischemic stroke, systemic embolism, etc. Um, so this shows the safety and again, if you're a statistician, it's too late now to understand this good. To me, all this means is they need to see upper uh, boundary of a 95% contact interval to be less than this number here, 2.61. And if it reached less than that, than that number, then we determined in the study planning that this would be sufficient to prove safety uh, or to show that the safety is improved. And so we did meet the safety endpoint. Do you understand that? Do you, you know, you know this, uh, how people plan this? Uh, uh, do you have any understanding of that? Maybe a little bit, yeah. I don't know how they choose that number. I don't know how they chose 2.6. Okay, good. Just, I don't know. But all I know is there's, there's this thing right there, right? And, and this, is, this, is, uh, this is above this is not good. It was below this, the contact interval, and it was pretty good. So it was pretty good. Safety was uh, deemed to be deemed as a medic endpoint. Um, these are just the events uh, shown more in detail. I'm not going to labor that, but um, safety was better. You can see all the event rates are, are lower. Tricardial effusion and with, with the with the yeah, survival immunization zero, perforation zero. It's pretty low event rate. Um, the problem was uh, the composite um, 18 months efficacy endpoint. Even though numerically it was pretty similar at 18 months, uh, maybe because of a small number of patients. The contact intervals were, were wide and they went beyond this. Um, okay, so it did not meet its uh, efficacy endpoint. Um, so it did not quite meet non inferiority, okay? Um, but the other safety, uh, the other efficacy endpoint, which was ischemic stroke and systemic embolism after the seven day uh, implantation period, that did show non inferiority to, to the endpoint. And so um, people were trying to explain why uh, they couldn't reach that, uh, that one endpoint, which was the 18 month uh, um, event rate. And part of the reason some people believe was that in the prevailed study of those treated with warfarin had an unexpectedly low event rate. So normally with their test last score, you'd expect their stroke rate to be somewhat up here. And so it was an unusually low stroke rate. And um, so maybe it was just a chance finding and I don't know. Um, but because of that data, uh, the um, FDA still didn't approve it because of uh, because of the fact that it didn't meet one of the uh, efficacy endpoints. Um, and so it took a little while longer until 2014. That's when the, the long term, the four to five year data from Protect AS came out. Uh, and then uh, after longer term follow up, uh, what, what was demonstrated is that. Um, there was no, there was no non-inferiority regarding ischemic stroke, okay. Um, but there was not just non-inferiority, but superiority regarding hemorrhagic stroke uh, with Washman versus uh, Warfarin. There was not just non-inferiority, but superiority in terms of disabling stroke with uh, in favoring the Washman. Um, and there was also. Um, uh, non inferiority regarding cardiovascular and unexplained death. Um, and um, if you look at the, the primary safety endpoint, uh, it, it didn't quite reach non inferiority uh, margins there. Um, this just shows the data in, in a, a graphical way. So, this is the primary efficacy point uh, death, uh, stroke, systemic embolism um, was significantly lower with the device compared to warfarin. Um, safety endpoint again, uh, eventually after time goes by, the, the curves are pretty close to each other in terms of safety. That's because bleeding continues with warfarin, but the uh, risks with the device are mainly related to the paired procedure of failure. And this is all cause mortality, which, um, which was not just non inferior, but it was superior with, uh, the, warfarin, with the Washington device. The Washington had lower all cause mortality. And you might ask yourself why that is. These are all the, the causes of, of death in the patient. And none of them uh, are different to clinical for the exception of hemorrhagic hemorrhagic stroke. So <coughs> probably the driver for the difference in uh, all cause mortality is the difference in hemorrhagic stroke. And that then 
finally probably get, uh, you know, help to um, convince the FDA panel to approve uh, the device in, in March of last year for use. Um, then came out, uh, and, but still the CMS reimbursement wasn't done. Then came out the meta analysis of protect um, AF and prevail, and uh, you can see that the, uh, the all cause stroke or systemic embolism rate uh, was the same, there's no difference, uh, so not better the all cause stroke rate, but the hemorrhagic stroke rate was, was lower uh, with the uh, device. Ischemic stroke rate just <coughs> is at the, con at the significant border of 0 0.05 to 2 value, so it might be at the slightly higher ischemic stroke rate, but again, much less hemorrhagic stroke rate. And um, then uh, the ischemic stroke rate beyond the implantation uh, period, um, there's no difference between the both and the device. And then again, CV and un unexplained death was lower, uh, but all cause mortality, if you lump both protect the F and prevail, you'll see that it didn't quite reach 0 0.05 or 0 0.07, but it's pretty close to a very strong trend mm -hmm. towards all cause uh, death reduction. And then, you know, obviously a major bleeding uh, beta set watching. So uh, LA Closer um, versus Warfarin, it's not superior for all cause strokes, it's superior for ischemic strokes, superior for all cause and cardiovascular mortality during the end of the based on protected death data only. Uh, superior is a primary six feet stroke, systemic embolism, cardiovascular death, and superior and non procedure is a short uh, And I think, I think probably part of the reason for the uh, team of the was the main analysis. So, what do we do? Uh, accept this patient, accept the stroke risk, do not anticoagulate, bleeding stroke three, we start anticoagulation, start anticoagulating more. Uh, or do we continue to put our hand in the sand and pretend as if the washing didn't exist? Uh, I think we can't do this anymore because patients will eventually start asking uh, for that process. And um, uh, what did the CMS um, note say? So, which patients uh, and under what circumstances was LA closure considered uh, uh, reimbursable? Uh, the TAS score has to be more than one, so two or more. The TAS VAS has to be more than two, so three or more. Um, there has to be a formal shared decision making interaction with an independent, non dimensional physician. It's kind of funny because it almost makes it seem like we don't trust the interventionalism to make that decision. You know what I mean? I mean, it's okay. I, I, I think it's a good, good idea, but it, it just makes you feel kind of like, like some kind of uh, uh, car salesman? criminal. Or yeah, 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 like a car, car salesman. Yeah. Yeah. There has to be somebody independent who says that. Yeah, your your skin of this is okay. You know. But that's that's part of the um, process currently. There has to be documentation of this shared process. Uh, and uh, there has to be suitability for short term and it's important, suitability for short term warfront, but please not be deemed unable to take long term anticoagulation. So the data of course is all in the setting of patients who are able to take long term anticoagulation, right? And the approval and the reimbursement is for patients who are not candidates for anticoagulation. It's kind of superficial. Um, uh, but that, that's what it is right now. And suitability for short term anticoagulation, what does that mean? Okay, so if you take this patient, is that patient suitable for short term anticoagulation? I guess maybe it's possible for how long was it, 45 days? Would be unreasonable, I think, to do that, right? Yeah. What if you what if you put this patient on aspirin and platelets? Would this be would this be acceptable based on this? I mean, I, I'm asking. I don't know. I I think it would because it just says the patient has to be suitable for short term anticoagulation. It doesn't mean you have to use it. Right? I mean, that's the way I understand it. So could you use aspirin and, and platelets in this patient? Um, I personally think it's okay to do that. Um, there's there's some data. I mean, there's the ASAP trial, which I, I'm not going to go into, but ASAP trial looks into safety of washroom implantation um, with aspirin products only. Um, uh, just you know, uh, no no control group is safety of that, and control and then comparing to historical controls based on task score. And the device associated trauma rate is is no different. Exactly the same, same control. Uh, I'm not sure how much 
benefit that warfarin will give you. Um, I certainly think that it's reasonable to use this aspirin and tonic. Um, keep going. Good. Um, but, but, you know, if you go by this statement, and if you want to be uh, as cautious as possible, you probably want to use 45 days of warfarin and then continue with um, aspirin and tonic and aspirin and definitely from six months on. And then uh, the patient should be under cohesive multidisciplinary team. And uh, then the hospital must have an ET or, or structural program. Uh, and then this is also important because it, it adds to the uh, labor and, and to the time that is spent with these patients because they should be enrolled in a prospective um, national registry, which is probably about 20, 30 papers long. So it's, it's a lot of work to fill it out. And then the company uh, and um, the registry investigators will keep track of that event. Uh, well, LA doesn't come doesn't come without a price. Um, this uh, can traumas on the device occur. Well, uh, this is a case example of a 70 year old male, permanent excess, has mass score of six, has blood score of three. Um, this shows the uh, implantation of 30 millimeter Watchman discharge on aspirin and clopidogrel. Uh, again, this is pretty much routine. Uh, I would say in Europe, to not use warfarin uh, after implantation. I think here, if I were to do it, I would probably use warfarin if possible because that's the situation in India. Um, and then uh, TE on day 88 after implantation, um, you can see the thrombus, which is sort of a layer of thrombus on top of the watching device. There was some, um, some hypothesis that maybe, remember that little screw in, that, that little screw that uh, you unscrew at the end and there's a um, that's a little nubbin left uh, that might have been thrombogenic, people thought, and they've now reduced the profile of that. But uh, this would be a typical Watchman thrombus. Um, just another view of it. Uh, so that patient example uh, was treated with uh, subcutaneous aspirin, DIB, and aspirin, clopidogrel, four weeks, followed by the bigger time aspirin, clopidogrel, and then at 200 days TE, uh, there was no residual trauma. Uh, what is the incidence um, of thrombi? We protect the effort with 20 patients out of the uh, 478 attempts. I think it was 463 implants. So um, there's a um, rate of about 4% of thrombi on the device. And, and that's just based on TE, right? So the reality is how many people have thrombi on and off? Maybe more than that, but that's just the number of uh, patients you catch with a true TE that one month in six months follow-up. Uh, but one thing, one good thing is that the minority um, had ischemic uh, events. Uh, and so I think only one patient out of 20 had a stroke that was thought to be due to thrombus. Um, and so the annual thrombus associated stroke rate rate is about 0.3 percent, which is pretty low. This was the ASAP trial I mentioned earlier with uh, this uh, clopidogrel and clavix uh, and then aspirin after implantation. And he had a 4% stroke risk, so it was a uh, 4% thrombus risk, so it was really not different from um, a protected act. Um, this is another case example. Uh, no, no device is immune to thrombus, by the way. Even the lariat is not immune to thrombus. And so uh, this is a, an, another example of a um, amplex or cardiac patient. T at 25 days. Um, I don't know why this does not play for any other physical. Um, and uh, if there's, there's a thrombus, and you would have seen it, it comes in and out of the picture as you play it. Um, and this patient was treated with warfarin, uh, had several TEs, thrombus was still present at day 277 after first discovery, and eventually after another course of sub Q lovenox, the thrombus went away. Um, this just shows the ACP, you can't see the ACP up there, but this is supposed to say ACP up here, just to, say, to show you that not just the watch, but also the ACP device has. The risk of thrombus is 2.4% in one study, 16% in another study, 3.5%, etc. So the thrombus rate, if you lump all this together, is about 4%. So it's no different from the um, Washington. This is data from Frankfurt, a 131 uh, Washington implantation. Thrombus rate is, again, roughly about 4%. Uh, ACP implantation, roughly about 4%. Um, and uh, then, you know, w w when do these occur? Malady management is, is difficult because a lot of patients are not candidates for anticoagulation. So um, I think sometimes using temporary Lovenox for, say, a month is not unreasonable. Um, 
you could use Lord Friend with no, you know, in Scott with Um And uh, these are the new generation devices. So it's either screw uh, nothing, both on the ATP device and the launching device, they have reduced the profile of that. Um, this also makes it more difficult for them to be smeared. Um, this is um, data from uh, the new ATP device, it's called Amulet, and it shows up with a thrombus rate is pretty low. Uh, and then the layer is also not immune to thrombus, even though you would think it would be because it doesn't leave any foreign body behind. But um, this is just an example on day 34, and I am assuming this might not say, but you can at least get the idea that there's a big thrombus there. Uh, and it's mobile as well. Um, and uh, the patient was uh, treated well with molecular heparin and thrombus was not mentioned. So no, no device is immune. This is another um, somewhat concerning report. There's only one such report, to my knowledge, in the literature. But <coughs> there can be device erosion. This is the erosion of the little, um, uh, those little barbs of the watchman mm -hmm. that eroded the pulmonary artery and caused the death. Uh, in this in, in this one patient, and it shows the eroded barbs here into the pulmonary artery right here. Um, so you know, potentially, if, if there's something to worry about, yes. I've only seen one such report, but people die all the time, right? Not everybody gets knocked to sleep. And it could just be more common than we think. Uh, I don't know. And then, of course, tamponade and um, implantation is, is uh, common with any, any device implantation. You have that risk. Um, uh, new devices. Uh, um, this is just, oh yeah, this is another another complication that uh, the type of device pay, which is embolization, and this will not say, but this can uh, watch when the device embolizes and blood uh, retrieves uh, the mare. This is the spine here, so this is in the um, aorta. And typically, what happens is uh, it, it lodges at the bifurcation of the aorta. Um, most of the time, it's smearable. Uh, it's just a big sheet and it's smeared. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, uh, so, conclusion we have exciting uh, new concepts with AI solutions, uh, but I think we have a way to go before we reach uh, perfection. Um, and uh, one thing that comes into mind uh, we've got a competitor now, which is uh, NOAA. Uh, so what should we do with people who have low risk of bleeding, no bleeding? Should we consider NOAX? Should we even consider uh, earlier closure for those patients? Um, and I think the question you have to ask yourself is, would you rather have an ischemic stroke? Answer that question, NOAX versus uh, uh, watchman and low bleeding risk, or would you which, of course, the stroke causes disability and so forth, so you can do that. Or would you rather have uh, bleeding in the GI tract? And I think most of the It took me a while. It took me a while. It's pretty cool, though. It's pretty cool. I think most, most people would, most people would favor that one. Um, even though it's likely that they would favor the bleeding, right? Most of them, right? And um, if you look at the meta analyses, uh, if you look at the NOAC trials, um, th there was a very strong trend towards towards ischemic stroke risk reduction. There was just like the Watson device, there was a hemorrhagic <coughs> stroke risk reduction. Um, there was, I didn't show it here on the slide, but there was an, uh, an all-cause all -cause stroke risk reduction. And there was also an all-cause mortality reduction in that meta-analysis, okay? And, uh, and yes, there were more GI hemorrhages, okay? But look at the main analysis of protect AF and prevail. Uh, all cause stroke with systemic embolism was the same. Right? It, was, it was not better, it was the same. Yes, hemorrhagic was lower, ischemic slightly higher, but all cause was the same. Uh, and um, all cause death didn't quite reach significance. There's a trend, but didn't quite reach significance, right? Uh, and the bleeding force was lower. So, uh, and this also show, shows the all cause. Uh, Stroke uh, or all stroke and systemic embolism in that same NOAX meta analysis, which favors NOAX over Wolfram. So, if you kind of lump this together, um, in terms of ischemic stroke, I think the data favors NOAX somewhat. In terms of all strokes or systemic embolism, the data favors NOAX a little bit, hemorrhagic stroke reduction. This 
is the reduction in gold. Archive that um, it didn't quite be significant in the meta-analysis in the LA closure, so I'm going to say there's a trend, but in NOAC, the meta-analysis was lower archive mortality. So to me, that's sort of a fortitude in favor of NOAC. Same thing with mobile units, I'm um, looking for mobile units. So everything changes, in my opinion, if the unit goes up, then I think one can't make this calculation. Um, Oh yeah, and we haven't talked about uh, all the procedural complications in there. So I think we can put our hands head in the sand uh, from all the complications. So in conclusion, um, I would rather have um, at least end scopes. If novel, I think are better at preventing scopes and suspending embolisms than warfarin. If LA closure is not better than warfarin, I prevent scopes and suspending embolisms. Why would anybody favor LA closure over anticoagulant therapy in case of resolving emotion? Um, just for a close talk. Um, and then, one thing I think is important too the trials um, for NOAC, how many patients total of 45,000 patients? Um, the Wolfram trials in Spinaf, uh, Apistac, uh, CAF trial, total patients 15,000, maybe 12,000, 15,000. And then, these are our patients in the um, protected absence of air. A pretty, pretty small number, and I think we should keep that in mind and not make a conclusion quite yet. Um, but again, I, I think uh, for high bleeding risk, Watchman certainly is an option we should offer it and <coughs> take into consideration in the patient That's it. Thank you. Yeah, great topic. Great topic to work out. I have a question. So, once you get to Watchman and these patients are at high risk for bleeding, what was the indication that they got the TV? Is it like an indication you have Everybody. to get it? A TV app like in six months yeah. to make sure there's no one, one month, uh, 45 days in six months. Oh, you have to have. Because remember, you have to decide at 45 days whether you change from warfarin and aspirin to propetic 